Thanks very much, Aaron, for uh, convening uh, this great series of conferences. Um, and uh, many thanks to the previous speakers for, for brilliant work. Um, I'm honor bound to mention that I am a writer. I do have copies of my books for sale um, and a new one out, uh, but the, which is about alternative and small scale economics, but that's not my brief today. Uh, today my talk is about biodiversity and it's derived from my chapter on that subject in the newly published uh, Post Carbon Reader. Um, now I'll say that my talk is going to qualify as wildly um, idealistic by uh, Taintarian standards. And, um, and frankly, I have no uh, proposals for ways to achieve the kinds of uh, goals that I'm going to call for. However, um, I believe what I'm presenting represents uh, consensus in conservation biology and really the minimum requirements for ecological resilience on the planet. Um, the reason I'm doing this today is uh, it is what might be uh, termed a spiritual calling. Uh, like Thoreau, uh, I am here today to speak a word for nature or biodiversity as it's less poetically called. Let the fact that the human economy is a subsystem of the planetary ecosystem be seared into our consciousness with the green fire of life. No nature, no civilization. <clears throat> 2010 is the United Nations International Year of Biodiversity. At the recent 10th conference of the parties to the Convention on Biodiversity, much of the discourse was an attempt to quantify the economic value of biodiversity to human communities. Making the argument in terms of the dominant worldview, economism, was strategic but desouling or desacralizing. <clears throat> Let us rather base our deliberations, designs, and actions on the premise that all species in the Earth's biotic community, not only Homo sapiens, have a right to live out their evolutionary destinies. That nature should not have to justify its existence in economic terms. An incalculable stirring of love for the Earth might inspire us to transformational feats. We and our fellow creatures face grave threats, human overpopulation, climate destabilization, water scarcity, depletion of non-renewable resources, especially of oil and other fossil fuels, and a host of social disturbances. Of all the calamities we face, though, perhaps the most egregious is the Earth's sixth great extinction crisis. The normal rate of extinction is about <clears throat> one in a million species per year. The extinction rate today is between 100 and 1,000 times that. These numbers are, are so vague because an accurate census of the planet's biotic community is likely impossible. Of the 50 million or so species living on Earth, only about 1.75 million have been described. <clears throat> Our species has deforested, plowed, bulldozed, dredged, drained, dammed, polluted, or paved one half to one third of the land surface of the earth. All of this violence has been the outcome of our economic paradigm, the trajectory of civilization, and our beliefs about the world. Such actions have wrought essentially irreversible changes in the biosphere. Our responses must amount to more than just techniques for human survival. 
For as the late conservationist David Brower remarked, you can survive in jail. Over the next century or so, we are bound to go through some hard times. We will either choose or suffer drastic changes in our way of life. We will perforce consume far less and produce locally more of what we do consume. Urgent as it is to diminish our consumption and find more sustainable ways of producing the necessities, a decline in human population is perhaps most crucial if biodiversity is to rebound. A reduction in the number of births to woman, per woman to replacement level or less should be the aim. Fortunately, the means to that end coincide with female emancipation, universal education for girls, free and universal access to health services, including contraception, abortion, and maternal and infant care and economic opportunities for women all conduce to smaller families and greater equity and well-being. <clears throat> if we cannot reduce our numbers voluntarily, we may be assured that they will be reduced involuntarily. On Earth, no population of organisms reproduces ad infinitum. And now, I brought some party favors. Uh, endangered species condoms, that were put out by the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm going to try to lob them towards people that look reproductive. <laughs> the, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity is a, a savvy outfit that uses the Endangered Species Protection Act to sue to try to prevent extinctions, and this last year they did this endangered species condom campaign with hilarious slogans. One of my favorite uh, features a picture of an amazing organism, the American burying beetle, and the caption is, uh, save the burying, uh, cover your tweedle, save the burying beetle. <laughs> anyway, um, we human beings are in the continuum of life, subject to its rules, available to its splendors. Our membership in this community is not a romantic idea, but a fact of evolution. We are biological organisms. We exist because for five billion years, life on this amazing planet has been developing, diverging, and colonizing niches from the deep sea floor to the ice of the world's rapidly melting glaciers. No species lasts forever, but every creature embodies an inimitable saga of existence and adaptation. The vast majority of species comprising Earth's biodiversity are wild. Without them, we would not and could not exist. They provide ecosystem services, such as food from soil and sea, production and maintenance of oxygen and other gases in the atmosphere, filtration and detoxification of poisons, climate moderation, regulation of fresh water, decomposition of wastes, recycling of nutrients, soil creation, control of pests and disease vectors, and storage of solar energy and food and fuels. They serve as an immense trove of the genetic information that it will allow for future evolution. In addition to the species-rich tropical rainforests and the animals that conservationists refer to as charismatic megafauna, these being great beasts like lions and wolves, and the hoofed animals like zebra, antelope, elk, and bighorn sheep on which they prey, Biodiversity includes myriad inconspicuous beings like bacteria, insects, bats, which incidentally are dying by the millions now because of a mysterious uh, fungal infection, and rodents whose roles in the web of life are fundamental. About 70% of the Earth's flowering plants depend on insect pollination. Among these are more than two-thirds of the crop species 
that provide about a third of the foods and beverages that we consume. Many wonderfully elaborate and exclusive structural relationships called mutualisms have co-evolved between wildflowers and pollinators. Deeply hidden nectars lure in the long bills of hummingbirds or proboscises of moths. Such wild pollinators, not only insects, but bats and birds as well, are essential to the survival of the plants they've co-evolved with. And about a fifth of all flowering plants now face extinction. In nature, there is no waste but death and transformation. Without the ecosystem services of what are called detritivores, critters that dine on organic debris, like that American berry beetle, and other reducers of carrion and leaf fall, we'd be neck deep in corpses and dead vegetation. Vultures, fungus, microbes, larvae, and beetles are among biodiversity's undertakers, consuming the dead and transforming them into the makings of soil and future creatures. Synthesizing such intricately related functions and life support services of wild nature would be plainly impossible. Bear in mind that every domesticated plant, animal, or insect, like the honeybee, that we depend on for food and fiber descended from a wild ancestor. We are heavily dependent on just a handful of domesticated plants and animals. Nine-tenths of global livestock production is made up by only 15 mammal and bird species, and three-quarters of our food supply comes from only 12 plant species. Raised in monocultures, these organisms are quite vulnerable to parasites and diseases. Given such vulnerability, we not only need to preserve the diversity of plants and livestock developed by the farmers and gardeners around the world who bred varieties adapted to their specific bioregions. We must preserve the wild lands where these stocks originated as reservoirs of genetic diversity that will be essential to the resilience of eco-social systems. Vegetation and precipitation are interdependent. Plants draw soil moisture up through their roots, stems, trunks, and branches and emit water vapor from their foliage. The process influences cloud formation over land masses. Deforestation generally leads to a decrease in rainfall. Forests precede civilizations, deserts follow, as the saying goes. Plants sequester carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. Biodiversity embodied by forests and other plant communities is the matrix of a tolerable climate and the water cycles life depends on. Clearly, biodiversity preservation must undergird any serious strategies for a transition towards a post-carbon steady state economy. This means securing wild places where ecosystems can persist or recuperate. Among conservation biologists, there's broad consensus that a global system of ecological preserves and heritage sites must include healthy representative examples of the Earth's, of the planet's many types of ecosystems or biogeographical provinces. And I, I can't claim any great knowledge of this recent um, Convention on Biodiversity meeting, but I believe that their kind of opening offer in the negotiations was to try to set aside 20% of the uh, Earth's um, surface, including the waters, for uh, biodiversity preservation. Probably got talked way down. And as I understand it, the United States did not sign the convention. Um, Within biomes or ecoregions, these preserves must be connected, particularly along north-south axes, to allow for both normal and climate-driven migration. To function naturally, ecosystem preserves must be big enough to support a full complement of plants and animals, including keystone species, which often require extensive territories. These are plants or animals that play a pivotal role in their ecosystems. 
When keystone species vanish, the ecosystems that pivot on them are impoverished, losing diversity, resilience, and function. When they are restored, biotic richness may return. The health of ecosystems also depends on the dynamic balance between predator and prey species. Wipeout predators, which may be seen as varmints, competing with humans for economically valuable plants or animals, and ecosystems deteriorate. Predators like wolves, for instance, keep plant eaters like deer and elk in check. As Julia Whitty writes, the world is green because carnivores eat herbivores. Reaping biodiversity in the form of game, edible or medicinal plants, or useful fiber is still an essential part of life for many people around the world, supplementing and enhancing diets and health, providing food, shelter, and clothing independent of the money economy. Those interdependencies can serve as templates of the collaborative relationship, of collaborative relationships between human beings and their ecosystems. Hundreds of communities across the earth are reversing the vicious cycles that drive ecological and social decline. Savvy human ecologists, an ecologist and a journalist, Jerry Martin and Steve Brooks, have collected and analyzed some of these stories and identified what they call eco-tipping points. These are points of inflection where human interventions produced virtuous cycles. And um, they identified uh, essential elements of these, these uh, uh, tipping points that, that allowed for an intervention that led to a virtuous cycle. Among these essential elements are things we heard from um, our, our permaculture maven earlier, uh, transforming waste into resources. Another crucial uh, element that's got to be present is social and ecological diversity, and social and ecological memory. So that would be the elder knowledge that has stood the test of time, and the evolutionary memory embodied in the intricate relationships that are the very life of biotic communities. Letting nature do the work, say these human ecologists, is pivotal. Our charge and opportunity then, wherever we are, is to preserve and protect biodiversity so that it may mobilize its regenerative powers. Naked new volcanic islands born out of the spreading seafloor, by and by, receive bird, plant, spider, and insect colonists that multiply, are eaten, and die, all becoming soil to host more variations of form and greater diversity. We can take inspiration from such patterns. Life wants to live. Recovering from mass extinctions is nothing new for planet Earth although it may take 10 million years or so for such a richly diverse community of organisms to evolve again. For our part, and for the sake of the worlds to come, we must become a constituency for wild nature and arrest the extinction crisis. Our careful concerted action, abetted by nature's phenomenal capacity for regeneration, could affect a transition beyond industrial civilization to a stable world of flourishing land-based communities inhabiting a planet that still hosts a wild variety of life and culture. Quixotic and improbable of achievement, as this may sound, as we assess our prospects for making it through these predictable crises of globalized civilization, let our plans and visions be generous and aware, not merely human-centered, but biocentric. Let us locate our endeavors within the greater reality of nature and treat it as sacred. Thank you.